Hello, welcome to lecture 21. Today we're going to be talking about set containment, the idea of uh, one set being inside of another set. That's uh, section 4.2 in Jaya. So uh, first off, we're going to, well, let me first say kind of what the course of the uh, talk will be today. We'll uh, have a section where we contrast the idea of a, being an element versus the subset idea and make sure that we're all clear on, you know, there, there's slightly different versions of what it means to be inside of another thing. Um, then we'll see that, that the latter thing, the subset inclusion or containment, is uh, related to logical implications. And then we'll, uh, we'll end up by talking about some, well, how to, how to handle that kind of stuff in Sage and also how to typeset it in Overleaf. So we'll have a fairly short content uh, talk today, but give you a few tips on how to do computing with these uh, sort of structures and how to write up your results in, in a nice way in, in LaTeX. So let's get rolling. Um, good point here. Sometimes sets contain other sets. This is, um, oh, wait, I did say other sets. So yeah, it does, could a set contain itself? That's sort of a natural question to ask. Why, why do you throw the word other in there? Um, Seems like a bad idea, doesn't it? If, if a set was in its own self, then in, inside of itself, it would have a copy of itself, which included another copy of itself in there. And, you know, you'd, you'd get sort of stuck into a infinite regress, like uh, looking into a mirror when there's another mirror behind you and you get that infinite tunnel of images of yourself. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty clear we shouldn't have a set that's containing itself, but you could have other sets in a set. So one way to think about what are the elements of a set is to follow this, this little trail of thought I'm trying to lay out here. Say what, what are top level commas? So they're just, they're the commas that are inside the sort of biggest or outermost set of French braces, but they're not inside any of the other ones. That's top level. So I'm going to, well, actually, we're looking at a set right now, the set with one and two. It's only got one comma, and that's a top-level comma. It's, it's not inside anything else. But if we look at its power set, that's a little more complicated, and there are some things that are not top-level commas. So there's the power set. You have the empty set, of course. You have the two singletons, and then you have the entire set, one, two. And the, the little arrow things are pointing at the, the top-level commas. Actually, I guess this isn't all that complicated, so there's only one comma that's not a top-level comma. But the things that are inside the braces and separated by those commas, those are the elements. Uh, yep, that's what I just said. <laughs> Use the funny E sign for elements. So here's an example. Suppose A is 1, 2, and 3, 4. I shouldn't say it that way. It's got the number one, the number two, and the set three comma four in it. So it's correct to write one as an element of A, right? Yeah, that makes sense. It's also cor correct to write the set three comma four is an element of A, because it's one of the things that's in between the top level commas. It's wrong to write three as an element of A. Why? Because, wait, why is it wrong? Because three's in there. Yeah, but it's not in there at the top level. Three is a, an element of a, an element here. It's not in A, it's one of it, it's in one of A's elements. So three shouldn't be listed as an element or a member of A. All right, th so that relation that the element sign gets for us is called membership. You're a member of a set if you're if you being on the left and the set on the right of the E sign makes true. Uh, another way you can be in there, not maybe not you, but a thing can be in there is called containment. And this is a broader idea. Uh, it's based on the former thing, though. A set is contained in another one if all the elements of the first one are also elements of the second. So saying in terms of A and B, if A, if you want to say A is contained in B, you need to check that all of A's members are also members of B. Multiple ways to say that. So the symbol for that, for the is, is contained in idea, is this sort of 
Uh, looks like a C almost with an underlying on it. Um, I, I want to point out, well, I'm going to point out, I guess, to a greater extent soon, that that is a stylized version of the less than or equal sign. Um, anyway, the things on either side of it have to both be sets or else it, it doesn't make sense. This is the way it was defined. Con containment, if all of this guy's elements are also elements of this guy. This guy. Um, well, if you're not a set, then you don't have elements, right? So that's that would be weird to have a thing other than a set on, on the two sides of, of that subset symbol. If you write this three is an element of the natural numbers that's a sensible statement but if you write three is contained in the naturals people are just going to look at you weird because that that just makes no sense you have to have sets on both sides of the uh, subset containment thing okay so there's a there's an exercise in the giant book on page 172 which i want to pull up and this is it We'll, uh, we'll go through it. There's just try to check that we know the difference between subset symbol and the element symbol. So there's just one set here. It's got, well, first, let me ask, how many elements does it have? If you just counted symbols, one, two, three, four, there's five things. Well, then there's some braces in there. So some of the commas are not top level. Actually, it's only that one that has a non-top level comma in it. So we've got three top level commas. Three things are sufficient to divide it up so that there's four elements. I'm doing this gesture because I think it means something to people. Oh, all right, if I've got three fingers, there's actually one, two, three, four spaces and that, that those fingers can divide, divide things up into. All right, so fine, we've got one, two, the singleton set one, and, this, and the two set with A and B in it. That's what's the contents of A. So is this a correct thing to say, that the set with A and B in it is contained in A? I mean, it's not wrong in the sense that it's just malformed like the things I was talking about a second ago are. That's a set and that's a set. So we've got two sets on either side of this containment symbol. But it's not a true sentence, or it's not a true logical statement. Um, for this to be true, we'd have to check that all the elements on this side, the A and the B, are in A. And they aren't. The things in, in A are this number, this number, this set, and this other set. There's no A's or B's in A. I know they're in there, but they're in there inside of something else, so they're kind of protected from, from view when you're thinking about A. Number two there, well, that's correct. A, the set AB is one of the things in between the top level commas in set A. All right, what's three say? Three, A is an element of A. There it is. But no, not really, because it's inside of one of the elements of A. It's not really directly in A. Is one an element of A? Yeah, that's good. Here it is. Because of that one up front, we can say one is an element of A. That one is one of the ones that's separated by commas. If I were thinking this one did the job, I'd be wrong. Right? That one, not an element of A, it's inside of an element of A. Uh, could we say that? One is contained in A. No, that's, that's the malformed sort of thing where we don't have a set on either side of the, uh, the subset sign. Does this one make any sense? Is it true that the set with one in it is contained in A? Well, it's it's not, you know, a nonsensical thing. We do have a set on the left and a set on the right, so it could be contained. Um, for this to be true, we need to check that that one element of the set with one in it is in A. And it is. It's the first thing in A, in fact. Can we say that the set with one in it is an element of A? Yes, we can do that too. But now that one is for for this middle guy's reason, because the singleton set with one in it actually is one of the things that appears be, between the top level commas in the definition of that set. How about that one? Is the set containing two an element of A? 
No, I don't see any sets containing two. Is the set containing two contained in A? Is it a, a subset of A? Well, yes, it is. It's one element is two, and two is one of the things up here in between the commas. Good. This is probably the hairiest one. Is the set with the set with one in it contained in A? If this is this is a set and a set on both sides, so that part is is all right. Um, if this containment is supposed to be true, then let me try to highlight it. That part, the set with a one in it, would need to be an element of A. Yeah, and there it is. Right? So this guy has no top level commas, by the way. So the, the just the thing that's inside the, the outermost curly braces is the the one element there. All right, so yeah, that was that was fun. <laughs> kind of, I thought I enjoyed that. All right, uh, look at how the symbol for subset containment looks very similar to the set symbol for less than or equal. It's really just a rounded off version of the same thing. And there's a reason for that. I, I was embarrassingly old before I, I finally figured out which way the inequality points between things. I always had to stop and beat my head on against it to realize how how the direction of the less than or less than or equal signs worked. And then a student told me a trick which just works and now I've got it. So you you imagine that less than sign as being the mouth of an alligator. So if you want I sometimes like to draw teeth in there, but I'm not going to do that on the slides. What's the, if the alligator is hungry and he's got a choice of a, of a skinny little water buffalo or a great big, huge water buffalo, he wants to eat the big one. So he'll turn his head to face the open side of his head to face the larger meal. That, that's the, the image that suddenly makes the direction of the less than or equal sign clear to me. And it works for sets too. The subset containment symbol is rounded version of the, uh, less than sign, it still looks like a mouth, and the mouth will be pointed at the bigger set. So it's probably not the like most you know, high-toned uh, adult sort of thing to say, but the Hungry Alligators sorts that out for me, so hopefully it helps somebody out there. All right, so if A is actually definitely inside of B, we've got a variant of this symbol, just like less than or equal has strict less than, subset or equal to has this version. And that's called proper containment. I don't know if we ever used the term in the book, but you would say A is a proper subset of B, which I, I think is kind of interesting usage. Proper means that you're someone who follows uh, rules of etiquette well, right? And uh, for a set to be proper seems strange, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that's the term. So uh, well, we skipped to two buttons, but the, first of all, the symbols are reversible. Yeah, just like less than has also greater than subset also has a, a version that points in the other direction. That's called superset. I think that usage makes sense. If sub is one, then super should be the other. But so um, you definitely see this less often than, than the usual direction, the opening to the right. But you do see it occasionally, and so if you read, if you see something like that, you would read A is a superset of B, or you could kind of read it in reverse and say B is a subset of A. They're, they're the same idea. And of course, if you knew that they weren't equal to each other, that you could exclude that case somehow, you could say A is a proper superset of B, or B is a proper subset of A. All right, so how is all this stuff about um, sets related to logic? Because really the, the uh, way we're going to try to proceed with this section is to, uh, is, is to kind of cut corners because we've already looked at a lot of the same stuff in logic. So that's, it's important that we sort of develop that parallelism. So, um, well, let's give you an example to work with. 
you think about the numbers between 10 and 30 that are 1 mod 4. In other words, they, you could say it this way too. They, they are 1 greater than a multiple of 4. All right, I think I know what those are. Uh, 12 is a multiple of 4, so 1 bigger than that is 13. And then I could say, okay, 16 is a multiple of 4, and 1 bigger than that is 17. But the, the quicker way is to go just jump up by 4 in between these. 13 and 4 is 17, 17 and 4 is 21, 21 and 4 is 25, and then, excuse me, 29. So those are the things that are 1 mod 4 in the range between 10 and 30. Nice example. The membership criterion for A, we call it M sub A, right? It's this. First, X is between 10 and 30, and X mod 4 is 1. Sorry, that broke a line there. Uh, well, next one, let's consider the set of all the odd numbers in the same range. That's a bigger set. 11, 13, 15, 17, right on up to 29. They're all, all the odd numbers in there. Uh, which set is contained in the other? I think it's A is inside of B. Look at, look at the elements of A. I, I've got 13, 17, 21. Let's check those. 13, 17, 21. So far, they're all in here. Are 25 and 29 also down here? Yes, they are. In fact, there's a nice little pattern here. The the members of A are sort of every other set, uh, every other element here. Check them out. 13, then skip one. 17, then skip one. 21, skip one. Oops, I highlighted wrong. 25, then finally skipping the 27, 29 is, is one mod four. So A is contained in B. Clearly it is. <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't that clear at first, but I guess it is. Look, A is the smaller set. Which way is this alligator facing? He wants to eat that big juicy B. He doesn't care about A. Okay, how about the membership criteria? How are the membership criteria related? So the question, is the membership criteria for A going to imply the membership for B, or does it go the other way? Now, part of the membership, I just wanted to get a finite collection, so I put a, a range on X, and you notice that the, the two sets have the same range. They both have... X is between 10 and 30 as part of their, uh, their conditions. But um, one thing has X mod 4 equals 1 as its membership criteria. What is the other guy's membership criteria? I guess you could say it is X mod 2 is equal to 1. It's odd. So which implies which? Does being odd get you that you're 1 mod 4? Or does being 1 mod 4 get you that you're odd. I hope you see that it's this. The membership criteria for A being in this smaller set forces you to be in B, this larger set. It's not true the other way around. If, if being in B forced me to be in A, that would mean like 11 should be in A because it's here in B and it's not, wait, it's not there. So no, this, this one's off. Okay, so that first guy, I, 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 let me just highlight it to indicate. That's, that's the true one. And so we have A contained in B, and the membership criterion for A implies the membership criterion for B. Now, when I first look at that, I still remember, it's been 40 years probably when I first looked at this, but it boggled my brain because they seem to have arrows pointing in the opposite direction as one another. You, do you, I don't, hopefully it doesn't bother you because then this won't be necessary, but... The containment symbol seems to be pointing towards A, and the membership symbol seems to be toward, towards M of B. The, you know, they're just, they're not in the same direction. So, how to sort that out? Well, one thing is, think of, think of the containment symbol, not in terms of what it points at, but in terms of that open mouth of the alligator, what it's aiming to eat. That's the direction of it. So really that A contained in B is pointed at B, not at, not at A, even though that's the, the pointy end if you're thinking about a, a less than sign. Yeah, confusion. I don't know. So let's try to straighten that out. Who 
my my personal way of thinking about this is not very um, mathematical, logical, to be frank. It's just a, a vague notion of strength. I think it, it's I think this makes sense to people that if you say a statement P implies a different statement Q, that means P is kind of stronger in some sense. Why? Because you know if you know if if if, if you know something is P then and P implies Q, you, you sort of get for free that piece that the, the Q statement is, is true. So let's think about this example. Compare being a fourth power to being a square. What's the stronger notion? More, let's formalize it a little bit. To say something's a fourth power, the membership criterion would be that there exists some integer so that X looks like that, that thing to the fourth. X equals K to the fourth power. Okay, and okay, Q of X would be there exists K and Z such that X equals K squared. Now, one of those implies the other. Can you tell which is which? If I'm a square, do I automatically also know that I'm a fourth power, or is it vice versa? If I'm, if I'm a fourth power, I automatically know I'm a square. Yes, it is vice, vice versa. Because, look, if... if if x is equal to k to the fourth, the fourth power is the squared square. It's the second power to the second power. So um, if you're a fourth power, you're automatically a square. You're the square of k squared. Maybe it would be clearer if I didn't use k in both cases, but they are independent of one another, so it's fair to do. Okay, so this is the truth. For all x and z, p of x implies q of x. Being a fourth power does imply being a square. That makes P the stronger thing. Just emphasizing one more deal. It's a bigger deal if you're a fourth power than if you're just a square. All right, so, so here's a list. This is the set of fourth powers up to the fourth power of four. So they grow quickly. Right? And B is, well, that's the ordinary square, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. And if I'm in one of these sets, I know I'm in the other. Does that make sense? The, being in A automatically gets you into B. We don't see too many of them. 0, 1, and 16, those are the ones that actually appear in here. But 81 will be in here eventually because it's 9 squared. 256, that'll be in here eventually because it's 16 squared. You know, so, so yeah, being in A automatically gets you in B. Now, when you think about sets, What's stronger? What does stronger mean in a set? I think it's a good idea to think about, you know, fraternities or sororities or things like that. Uh, clubs that are exclusive. So which would you rather be in? The, the, the exclusive club that only a few lucky souls get to be in or, or you know, a club that takes anybody? It seems like the more exclusive one is the better one, the stronger one. Um, yeah, and that's that's probably the smart way to think about it. The, the smaller set is actually the stronger thing. So it belongs on the. Well, now I'm confused because that makes it on the on the side away from the alligator. That's true because it's not prey. The stronger set is is the one that uh, the alligator doesn't want to bother eating, even though it's that's a little weird because it does have more. Th no, it has fewer things in it. That's right. Um, Okay, I, I, I'm going to just end this with a little um, little bit of humor. There's a comedian named Groucho Marx that is probably 100 years old at this point. No, I mean, his material is 100 years old. He'd be probably 150 or so. He's uh, long, long past uh, prime, but he was really funny. He had some, some great uh, lines. He was one of these people that was famous for being able to kind of come off with a quip and often he didn't prepare those things. He just he had that kind of quick mind that would come up with things in a hurry. So once Groucho Marx made the comment that he would never want to belong to a club that would take him as a member, I just think that's that's cute. And it's also it makes the point about exclusive clubs or are the ones that are better, the the stronger idea. Right. So uh, moving on, let's let's first do a little talk about 
computing. We'll, we'll do that in CoCalc and Sage. There's base, just a few things I want to point out about how Sage handles the subset, superset ideas, and uh, and also how it handles the element idea. So let's pull up a Sage. Oh, I've already got it open. I actually pre-typed some stuff in here so that we wouldn't we wouldn't be slowed down by my typing speed. Um, the last time we looked at a, a constructing a set, I showed you both ways to build a set: the Python style and the Sage style. These are both the Sage style. So set with a, a list as its argument get, creates a Sage set structure that uh, contains those elements. And it prints itself out as curly braces like, with the elements in it. So let's just run this so that we uh, have the, oh, that was quick. Sometimes it's, it's lost its connection to the server by the time I come back to it. But this time we're good. So, before I actually type this, let me get you a new line. The way to find these functions that are related to a given data type, which is probably something I should say first, there's a function in Sage that will tell you what type of thing you're dealing with. So type of A there. That's a, that's actually a class, but that's fine. It's a Sage sets set set object enumerated with category. Well, you really don't need to know what that is, but it is a set. You know, it's 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 in the, the hierarchy of things that are sets. And sets all have this a pile of functions that can be used with a member function. So let's let's see what a few of them are. Hit a tab after you well, hit the a period and then hit tab, and you'll see a list of of things that you can do with sets. And many of these are, are not going to be useful to you for some time. But uh, that's a good one. Cardinality, that'll tell you how big a set is. Uh, that's not really the one I wanted. I was hoping it said something around in, about um, is this. I was looking for a subset when I originally went through this, and I couldn't find it. If we if we jump up to the S's, there's set, there's subsets. That's the thing that gets you the power set, but not just is a subset. And then I thought, oh, maybe it's. In here somewhere else, so I, I look around more, and there it is, is subset. So if you say A is subset B, well, here it is in the next cell. Let's run that. True. Um, you want to be careful about which direction that is, because I think it can be confusing. If you say A dot is subset, do you mean A is a subset of B, or do you mean B is a subset of A? And so I kind of wish the sentence or the, the function was named is subset of, because then it would read better. But that's what it means. A is a subset of B. Um, go back to the to the definitions. A had one, two, and three in it. B has one through four in it. So which one is a subset of the other? A is contained in B. So that was true. If you try it the other way around, B is subset A. No, it isn't. There was there's also a function called is superset, which already at the output there, it is true. B is a superset of A because A is a subset of B. Those are synonyms or, well, anyway, different versions of the same thing. Here's a slightly more complicated example to, to make this set because I wanted it to contain not only some elements but also another set. And I wanted some visual variety. So I had to first define some variables, because if you don't do that phase, it doesn't know what the heck A and B are. So you define some variables. A and B are the variable names, and A and B are how they're printed. So that's that's just a very common Sage syntax. You'll see it over and again. First, I'm making a set that has one, two, and the set with A and B in it. And secondly, I'm making a set that just has one and two in it. And then we're printing them both on the line. So uh, one comma two B A, and then just one two. All right. So is A in C? This is the the, the Sage syntax for checking whether an element is a member of a set. Different from the subset idea. Is A in C? It is not. Even though C was this set that you know in its very definition it has it has an A in there somewhere. But it, it recognizes things the way I was saying before. 
it's got the set with B and A in it, but that doesn't mean A by itself is one of the things in between the top level commas. So that help, that's a false one. Is one in C, that is a true thing. Oh, I should, I should have done one other thing. How about, is the set that has A comma B in, uh, which one was that, C? Yeah, that is true. Is, then I was asking, is C is subset D? C is a subset of D. False, it's not. C is the small one. No, C was the big one. Yeah, C is the one that's got more stuff. So is C a subset of D? It couldn't be. That's, by the way, that's a, a great um, a litmus test. You know, you can say, I'm, I've got a proposed inclusion. This set is supposed to be inside of this other one. Well, if the, the one that's supposed to be bigger is actually smaller, it's just the numbers, the, the sizes of the things, don't work out, then you can you can stop and say, no, that's not going to happen. All right, so is D is subset C probably is true, though, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, what do you think is going to happen if I press this? I've got the number one is, dot, is subset of C. This is going to programmatically, I hope, make clear the point that it, it doesn't make sense to ask if an element is a subset of something. You have to have sets on both sides of the operator. And you think about what the compiler or the, the runtime environment here is trying to do when I ask it this. It's trying to find a member function for the integer one that's called is subset. <laughs> and the integer one doesn't have such a member function. So it just pukes. You get an error. And a hard to read error, but here's what it is. Uh, the, the number one is of this type, it's a it's in sage and it's a ring and it's an integer in a ring and it's the integers in a ring. Um, anyway, that type of object has no attribute called his subset. There's no function, no member function or attribute with that name, which is why it doesn't make sense. Okay, so that's that's a good enough way to go with sage. Let's uh Let's come back to the slides. There's a couple of things I wanted to say about um, writing stuff in, in LaTeX using Overleaf. We're going to look on Overleaf anyway. You don't have to. But, um, so, you know, so, so that you can write set theoretic type proofs and, and not get too lost. Um, so the first thing is this. Curly braces are just a huge part of LaTeX syntax. They're all over the place. And, and Usually they're meaningful in, a, in an important way. So um, if you actually want to, and, and they're meaningful, but they don't appear themselves in the output. They, they tell you like to emphasize the text that's in between them or they're the arguments to functions, but they're not things that actually appear in the output. Well, if you want braces to appear, how do you do that? So that's one thing we're gonna look at. Um, there's a common problem that sometimes people have um, curly braces are just sized big enough to hold the characters that appear on one line of text. But in math, sometimes you have like a big summation sign or, or a fraction inside of a set. And it really looks dumb when the curly brace is little and then there's big stuff inside of it. It's because the curly braces are supposed to be the set idea. This thing contains that other one. How can these puny little curly braces contain that big sigma? That's, that's why I think it looks a little silly. So we want to be able to make the curly braces be intelligent so that they match the size of what's inside. So I'll show you how to do that. And then finally, how to get the commands for, how to, how to make the symbols for subset equals or all these other uh, things that are associated with it. We'll actually have to load a new package for that. But, uh, so let's, let's turn over to Overleaf. Uh, I've got it right here. I'm just going to go full screen with Overleaf so you don't need to see my face while we do this. Uh, we were previously working on this thing, and that's as far as I got. I think we'll add a new section. Uh, what should this section be called? Something about sets.
So first, let's just um, say we're going to draw a set. And let's use the display math environment for doing that. So I'll say A is equal to, and I want a curly brace, but if I do that, that'll be invisible. It's just assuming I'm grouping things with a curly brace. So here's how you make an actual curly brace. You put a slash in front of that guy. And we'll put a slash in front of the closing one too while it's there. That is how you make the thing literally draw a curly brace. So how about we put one, two, three, and heck, more curly braces. A comma, B comma, C. That's wild. Notice in my input, there's a big ugly space in there. Look what happens though when you, when you compile and you see what it looks like. Just realize I can make this a little bit smaller so we don't have to downsize things. You notice that the, the funky space over, over on the, in the source code side didn't appear over here. I mean, I can make it even crazier looking. Put a whole bunch of it in there. One of the things that drives people nuts that are used to working with something like Word is they put extra space in expecting to make it a little extra space. And they don't get it. And then, then they get angry and they think the program is stupid. But it's just this is the way it's designed. The program doesn't understand space. It, if you want space, you tell it to put in some space. If I really wanted there to be space somewhere in here, I can do that by putting in one of the math spacing symbols, like a slash with a semicolon. That creates an additional amount of space. Let's just watch that side uh, watch that side while I hit recompile. Did you see how the we open this up just a little bit? That's a subtle difference. If you want a whole lot of space you can put quad in there. That'll that'll make a, a giant space. It's not that giant, but it's pretty giant. And there's also Quad quad or Q quad. That makes a fairly enormous space. You don't really want that space, so uh, I don't, I'm only showing you because I wanted to make the point that literally putting spaces in doesn't do anything. Um, I, sh I should probably not do this right now, but just in case you ever feel like you really want to control the amount of space and none of the predefined ones are doing it for you. There's a command called horizontal space or H space. And you can put an exact amount on there. Like if I want it to be 1.12 inches, I can make that much horizontal space in there. Looks like more than that, but that's just because I've got the thing blown up so we can all see it well. Yeah, well, okay, we don't really want to do that. But, but anyway, that's how you make curly braces. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is, let's make another set so we can actually write something that's not silly. I'm just going to copy that guy and call it B, but we'll change the contents. One and three, and we don't need this thing. So because we don't have that, I don't want that comma. All right, so now A is the original thing we defined. B has just one and three in it. If I wanted to write that B was contained in A, I would type this, B slash subset EQ. I was looking for it to show me that uh, that was an option, and it didn't seem to do it. Hmm. Well, nevertheless, let's, let's move on. Uh, what happens when we compile this? Oh, it doesn't. Let's write that. Oh, that's because this symbol is actually in there already. Here's the problem. What if I want to take put in the symbol that says the sub it's a subset, but it's not equal to? And that's how you the command for it. Subset any q. And hit recompile. And now it came up with an error. And it says it's an undefined control sequence. And the way the output looks, it's just wow, that's hard to highlight stuff. It's hard to unhighlight stuff in here now. Yeah. B A with nothing in it because it doesn't recognize this as being anything. No space. So how do you fix that? The 
the symbol I'm trying to get there is not defined in, in the packages we've got loaded. So we need a new package. And I, this was on the slide. So uh, the, the new package is called the AMS symbols. It's, um, I, th I love the way that I start typing something and it gives me suggestions for what to do because sometimes I don't remember whether it's sim or sims. And when it has this options up, and I go, oh yeah, there it is, AMS sim. I can just select that, hit enter, and it finishes the typing for me, which is a great way to avoid the, these sort of confusing errors that happen when you've accidentally misspelled something like a package name. So now we've got a, a AMS symbol, all, of, all the things that are defined by that package, and that's among them is the subset not equal to. So is, oh, but wait a minute, is this true? Is B a subset but not equal to A? Oh, decidedly, yeah, B has got only one and three in it, and here's one and three in A, and there's plenty of stuff in A other than that, so they're clearly not equal. A has four elements, B only has two, so they couldn't be equal, that makes sense. The other um, symbol for subset is, is literally just pronounced, or spelled subset. So if I took the any Q off there, this is the proper subset symbol. Kind of means the same thing as the thing I just replaced with it. I, the thing that I just replaced. Uh, but the emphasis is different. This is, is just saying B's contained in A. The other one is saying very loudly that it can't be equal to. So that, that's sometimes something you want to do. The, the other direction, which we probably write down in our math environment, is that A is a superset. And uh, in Sage, you spelled out superset here in LaTeX, it is superset, like that. I didn't see the, the editor helping me with that. Uh oh, I hope I'm right. Let's see. Yeah, I got it. And you also have the A subset EQ version. So, yeah, no. And also the A subset not equal version. Sure. Okay, was there something else we were going to do in here? Oh, yeah. There was one last thing I wanted to do, which is to show you how to make your curly braces be smarter. So um, suppose I wanted to, well, I, I, let me give you an example. If, if I put a couple of fractions into a set, this is actually probably new to people too. I don't know if you've run into fractions before, but you see the command frac here by, by using the editor's suggestion there, it tells me I need two arguments. And that's inside these invisible style curly braces. So how about we put two in that one and three in that one. So that's one element of my set. And then the fraction, how about three, four? That's enough for now, okay. If I do this and then close the math environment and compile it, we'll get something that looks okay. Well, maybe it doesn't look okay. Do you see how wimpy these curly braces look compared to the, the contents of them? They're, they're just too small. It doesn't look right. So we'd like to have curly braces that resize so that they look at what's inside of them and go, oh, I've got to be bigger, make sure that I look like I literally enclose that two thirds. And this is how you do it on the, the opening curly brace, you say slash left. And you have to tell it what the symbol is that it's the left version of. This is not a curly brace, it's a left slash curly brace. And this guy over here is going to become a right slash curly brace. I don't know what the editor is trying to tell me there, but, uh, but what I just typed is correct. So we can recompile it and you see how much better they look? So this is a, a, a thing that you can do with any kind of symbol that's a delimiter. 
like the absolute value signs. If you put absolute values a, a, around a, a fraction, it'll they'll look silly because the fraction is much taller than the bars are. If you do left absolute value, you get a tall symbol. So any kind of delimiting symbol like that, parentheses, square braces, uh, curly braces, whatever, can you, they'll all have left and right versions as well. All right, that brings us to the end of our discussion of CoCalc. And also the end of today's slides. So uh, thanks for sticking it out. And uh, we'll be continuing on with section 4.3 in the next lecture. Um, so I hope you'll join me. And it's great if you, if you read in advance. Uh, I think that you spend your time more productively if you've already had kind of a a first pass at, at uh, trying to understand this stuff. And I'm trying to make sure I'm not terribly re repetitive, repetitive, repetitive <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, with the stuff in, in the giant book. So have a great rest of your day.